Hello, this is Memphis Community University. Today we are going to be doing an AP Calculus for response question, and it is going to be an AB multiple choice like. So this is a little bit different than our normal video series because with our normal video series, uh, we go over one for response question, and while we go from difficulty one through 10, the difficulty ramps up, but the questions don't really ramp up, and they're always the same. So for example, area and volumes, we are always doing area, volume by revolutions, volume by cross section. This one is a little bit different because this is all the miscellaneous stuff So uh, that you can uh, see on the AP calculus exam, on the AB portion. So this is a good free response question because it'll help us uh, practice some um, of the multiple choice questions as well. That's why we call it multiple choice like. So we do encourage you, if you support our channel, if you do like these videos, to watch difficulty 1 through 10, especially in this playlist, because all the videos are not going to look like each other, and you'll be able to um, consider a lot of questions that w could also appear on the multiple choice. And now we are in the latter half of this video series, so it's going to be uh, questions that are a little bit difficult, uh, a little bit more challenging, but that's what we're here for. We are here to improve. So in this case, it looks like we're going to be doing some integrals, um, some limits, uh, max or min questions. So let's get started. So the first question is, of course, find the equation of the tangent line. Um, so it, notice that the tangent line is of f, but g is defined here. So what we need to do for every tangent line is we need to find a point and a slope, where the slope is, of course, the derivative. So we want to find f prime of 25. And then we also want to find f of 25. So usually I go for the point first uh, because it'll be 25 comma uh, f of 25. But in this case, when we plug in 25 here, we actually have to do an integral. So that's actually going to be the harder version. Usually the slope is harder because you have to take a derivative. But in this case, it's actually going to be the point that's harder. So I'm going to start off with the derivative. So remember that if you're taking a derivative of an integral uh, by fundamental theorem of calculus, the second half, uh, because derivatives and integrals are sort of inverse processes, they sort of cancel each other out. So f prime of x, which we'll use in the future uh, throughout this first month's question, is g of x right here. All it is is, again, to take the derivative of an integral, you just replace the x. You just have the function that you started off with. And then, so when we want to plug in 25, we're just going to plug in 25 here. So it's going to be f prime of 25 equals, uh, we're going to plug it in here, it's going to be 2 times, uh, 25 plus 2, of course, is 27 to the negative one third. And while this free response question, of course, deals with calculus, we're going to have to deal with some sort of uh, negative exponents and fractional exponents throughout this question, as you'll see. So this is a good reminder, because we unfortunately, we don't have a calculator here. So we have to uh, compute these numbers by hand. So here, uh, the first thing I like to do is anytime I have a negative exponent, I'm going to take it to the denominator because that's what it means for a negative exponent. That's like an advert 2 review. So it's going to be 1 third. And then fractional exponents mean root. So in this case, it will be 2 over uh, the cube root of 27. So in this case, we're going to get 2 thirds as our slope. So again, this was just the derivative, but we actually didn't have to take a derivative because the derivative of f prime, uh, f prime itself, not the derivative, of f prime, but f prime itself is equal to g of x. So all we did is we plugged in 25 and we worked with this negative fractional exponent and we got two thirds in the end. So now we're ready for the point. So the point, what we're going to do, of course, is plug in 25 into this function. So let's do that on the side here. So when we plug in 25, we're going to get negative 125, um, this function right here. So it's actually nice that it's written like this as opposed to written as 2 over x plus 2 to the 1 third. Of course, that's equivalent because this is what the negative exponent means. But you would want to change it like this anyway because we're about to do the power rule. Uh, it's not ln because it's not just x plus 2 by itself. So if it was 2 over x plus 2, that would be ln. But this is 2 over x plus 2 to the 1 third. So you would want to convert it to this form before you start doing the question uh, so that you can take the integral. And technically, there's an inside function here, uh, so this would require a u substitution if you want to be very precise. I'm going to actually do the u sub as a practice, but you could actually just take the antiderivative, and you don't have to worry about any constants because the derivative of this function is 1, sort of like when you take the derivative of this function 
uh, when you do the chain rule, it would just be times one. So really the chain rule didn't do very much. But I'm going to do a U sub just as a nice practice. So what it's going to be is you let your U be X plus two. Uh, as alluded to before, DU would just be DX. You do want to change the numbers uh, because you want to change these to U numbers when you have a definite integral. So when X is equal to negative one, U is going to be one. How you do you change the numbers? Remember, you don't plug it into this thing. You just plug it into your U value. So when X is negative one, negative one plus two is one. Uh, and then we have another uh, U value. When X is equal to 25, uh, we add two to that. So U will be 27. That's great because we can take um, cube roots of that. So then you form an integral with U instead. So it's going to be integral two. There's no number in the front besides this two because we took it out because again, this is DX. If this were like 2x plus 2, then it would be a 2 here, and we would divide by 2, because that's how a u sub works. Then you replace your u with x plus 2, so x to the negative 1 third. And then if you write it like this, 1 to 27, you are not going to remember the old x values, negative 1 and 25. You care about only these u values, so for the rest of the question, I'm not going to see any x's. Uh, when you take the integral of this, this is... Again, a uh, power rule, you add one, so negative one third plus three is two thirds. And then we have this two in the front. And you also flip the new exponent, so it's gonna be three over two. So notice these twos cancels, which is pretty nice. And then we're gonna plug in 27 and one, uh, again, using the fundamental theorem of calculus. When you plug in the top upper limit with the U values, keep in mind these are U values and not X values. So what happens when you plug in 27 to the 2 thirds? So again, this is a sort of a fractional thing that you have to know, 27 to the 2 thirds. Um, some people get confused when you have these fractional exponents, but what I recommend is always do the root first because then you'll get a smaller number and then square it if needed. So in this case, um, you can rewrite it like this because this is an exponent law. So 27 to the uh, cube root of 27, that's 3. So you get 3 squared, which is 9. A similar thing... Uh, just as a practice, if you can just see this, uh, let's do 9 to the 2 thirds, or 3 halves. You would first take the square root first, the square root being 3, and then you cube is 27. So this is just practice with fractional exponents. Um, usually the fractional exponents work pretty well. So in this case, uh, 20, when we plug in 27, we'll get 27 to the 2 thirds, which is 9. These two cancel, so it would be 9 times 3, so that's going to be 27. Now we're going to plug in 1. Well, again, the same idea works. You can take the cube root and square, but one to any finite number is just one. Uh, so you're just going to get three because these two cancel again. So you're going to go uh, minus three. So the answer is 24. That's going to be the y coordinate. So we're going to write 25 comma 24. So let's just write the equation, the tangent line, and then let's review what we did because this question was pretty lengthy. So, uh, Whenever I write the equation of the tangent line, I use this point and slope, and I write it in y, uh, point slope form. So it's y minus the y coordinate equals the slope times x minus the x coordinate. And this is the equation of the line. So let's review what we did. First, to find the slope, all we did was take the derivative, but by the fundamental theorem of calculus, the derivative of f was just g. So all we had to do is plug in 27 and work with negative exponents. Then to find the y-coordinate of the point, because we were given the x-coordinate of the point, what we did is we plugged in 25 into this function right here, and we just did this integral. A little bit tricky of an integral, but still a pretty common u sub level, so it wasn't too bad. I actually did the u sub where I changed my u's to x's, or I changed my x's to u's, replaced all the x's in the integral, including the limits to u values, uh, did the power rule, added 1, and flipped the new exponent, uh, and then plugged in my u values, and I got 24. I practiced with fractional exponents along the way. And then uh, I once I have the point, it's pretty easy to find the answer. Uh, y minus 24 equals 2 thirds x minus 25. So let's move on. Again, not too bad of a question. It did require an integral at some point, but uh, if you're taking an A, B exam, you can expect that if you're taking an integral, it might be a u sub. So my next question here is determine the concavity of the graph of f of x for f, uh, x being greater than negative 1. Sorry, this says negative 1. And then we're going to justify my, our answer. 
So remember that there's actually two rules for concavity that are used throughout any calculus exam. The first one is f is concave up when f double prime is positive. We can just write this out. So f is concave up when f prime double prime is positive and when f prime is increasing. So both of these rules are valid and the uh, a similar thing is for concave down. f is concave down when f double prime is negative, f prime is decreasing. So the question is, if you want to answer concave up or down questions, should you use f double prime being positive or should you use f prime increasing? Well, there's different scenarios to use each one. If you can take multiple derivatives, like in this question right here, we, we are going to be taking multiple, uh, multiple derivatives. Then you should be using this rule because you can draw a sine chart of f double prime. So if they say, here's a function, see where this function is concave up or down or where's the inflection points of this function. That's this scenario right here. You should automatically take two derivatives, especially on the uh, free response uh, questions because the actual concave up or down might be only one of three points where finding the second derivative could be two of the three points. So again, anytime you can actually take derivatives by hand, you should use the f double prime positive rule because it'll be easy to find f double prime. Use f prime increasing more when you have graph free response questions where the graph is of f prime, so it'd be hard to find f double prime. And we have plenty of videos on those. Again, we have a video series for each free response question topic. Graph free response questions are one of the most common free response questions, and we use this rule a lot in those videos. f is concave up when f prime is increasing. For example, we also use f as inflection point when f prime goes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. But again, in this case, we're not going to use this one. We are going to use this one because we can take two derivatives pretty easily. So let's rewrite f of x. So f of x is equal to integral of negative 1 x g of t dt. We're going to take a derivative immediately. So that's f prime of x is equal to g of x. Remember, derivatives of integrals sort of cancel each other out. Finally, we're going to find f double prime of x. That's going to be g prime of x. So all we need to do is actually take one derivative of g. Uh, from the very beginning, g has been this function right here. So it's going to be 2x plus 2 to the negative 1 third. I'm going to take a second derivative of this. Um, if again, this was presented as a fraction, I would rewrite it as a fraction, a negative exponent because it's easier to use the power rule than it is the quotient rule. So this does equal this, for example. So if it was presented like this, I would change it to this before I take the derivative. So the derivative, of course, you drop this exponent down like it's hot. Um, so it's going to be negative 2 thirds x plus 2. And then you subtract 1 from the exponent. Just do this carefully. Um, when you subtract 1, it'll be negative 1 third minus 3 thirds. That's negative 4 thirds. So now I need to see whether uh, where this is positive or negative. So in this case, the thing to do is to um, first change it back to a fraction. So we change things to fractions in order to take integrals and derivatives. But once we're done with that, we change them back to fractions because they're easier to uh, manipulate algebraically. So we're going to write this as negative 2, 3, x plus 2 to the negative 4 thirds, or just 4 thirds because the negative goes away when we bring it down. So now what we have to decide is what does this graph look like or what is the sign chart of this graph? Well, if you have f double prime here, um, it only uh, the sign chart, when you have a sign chart of a fraction, you just want to graph each of the zeros of the sign chart. So you only have negative two. And notice that uh, when you plug in any number, because you're raising everything to the fourth, um, that number will be positive. So actually this function is negative for every single value. So no matter where you are on the sign chart, um, and actually we only care about x is greater than negative one, so we don't even need to consider this half of the sign chart. So when x is greater than negative one, for example, let x be zero, then you'll have zero plus two, two to the four thirds is some po positive number, times three is some positive number, two divided by that is a positive number. So when we negate it, everything will be negative. So we have a negative here. So basically this function is concave down um, for all of our x's greater than negative one because f double prime is negative there. So let's write that down. So f is concave down uh, for all x greater than negative one because 
f double prime is negative there. So again, what I'm trying to stress in this free response question that will help you on the multiple choice potentially is anytime you see the words f is concave up, f is concave down, f is inflection point, and they give you a function for f, what you want to immediately do is take two derivatives. In this case, the first derivative was the fundamental theorem of calculus. It got rid of the integral. And then the second derivative was uh, found using power rule. Once we took the derivative, we reconverted it into a fraction because that's often helpful in, in determining whether uh, this will be positive and negative for x being greater than negative 1. But the potential sign change of this function is only at x is equal to negative 2. Um, basically, any number that you plug in to the right of negative 2 it works the same way as any other number to the right of negative 2. And same thing with the left of negative 2. But we only care about numbers that are greater than negative 1. So we plugged in a random number greater than negative 1, saw that the sign chart is basically negative for all the numbers uh, for x greater than negative 1. So this function is concave down. Because the rule is f is concave down when f double prime is negative or f prime is decreasing. But again, you use that rule more often when you're provided a graph of f prime on those graph for response questions. So again, not too bad of a question. Just knowing what to do, even if the function is a little bit weird, concave up or down, try to take two derivatives. Oh, this is an integral. So what's the derivative of an integral? That's just the function. So if you let the question lead you and you sort of go for the right steps, then you'll definitely get points more so than if you were just gave up and you're like, oh, this function's too complicated. Uh, giving up is never the best option probably. You never know where they'll give you points. So for example, when I see the words concave or down, I am automatically try to take two derivatives because I might mess up the entire question. But as long as I try to take two derivatives, I might get a point for that. Uh, similarly, let's do this limit. This limit looks pretty complicated. So we're going to do this guy right here. Sorry, before I do this limit, let me change it. It should be f of x not g of x. I apologize. Um, so let's do this limit right here. So uh, anytime you're doing a limit on the AB exam, you should be aware that it could be L'Hopital's rule or the hospital's rule because um, that was an AP exam topic that was recently introduced on the AP exam and it's a how I do most of my limits. So let's try to elope that tall. In order to do it precisely, what you need to do is you need to verify the, that the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom is equal to zero. So let's do that. So I'm going to write it the precise way. This is a free response question. I'm not going to just write zero over zero. So what you do is you want to rewrite the limit of the top. This is going to be, give me f of negative 1 minus sine of negative pi. Remember that on the unit circle, sine of negative pi is the same thing as sine of pi. So when you plot this, it will be 0, negative 1. Uh, sine of negative pi is the same thing as sine of pi. And you use the, um, this is not negative 1, 0. Sorry, I don't know the unit circle, even though I teach it. It's uh, negative 1, 0, not 0, negative 1. So sine is the y-coordinate, so it's sine of negative pi is 0. Let's look at what f of negative 1 is. Well, when you plug in negative 1 here, uh, any number, any integral, when you have the same number to the same number, there's no area under the curve there. Uh, when you do the limit sums, there's no length of the base. So in this case, uh, f of negative 1 will also be 0. So for example, the integral from 2 to 2 of any function in the world is also 0. So in this case, we definitely get 0. So let's check the bottom to see if that's 0 as well when we plug in this limit. So we have ln, hopefully you can tell, let me rewrite that, ln of x squared. Hopefully you can tell the difference between my ln and my limit. I'd write the uh, three letters limit really fast, but there's technically an i there. Um, I don't even know what I'm writing anymore. So there's th two n's here for some reason. So let's make this one n. None of this matters. So we're going to plug in negative 1. Negative 1 squared is 1. ln of 1 is one of the ln's. You do want to know it's 0 because e to the 0 is equal to 1. So we do have L'Hopital's rule. Uh, we do have the limit of the top equals 0 and the limit of the bottom equals 0. So what we can say is by L'Hopital's rule, or if you're being funny, by the hospital's rule, And we're going to apply L'Hopital's, or what we say is we look, we're going to lope that tall. So we're going to write this original limit. Uh, 
and then we are going to write the uh, limit of the ratio of the derivatives. So this is actually applying Loeb v. Carlos rule. Notice how many times, even if I write it messily, I write limit. You have to write it for the numerator, the denominator, the original, and then the derivative limits. So in this case, what we're going to get is we're going to get uh, f prime of x. Let's take the derivative here slowly. So uh, this is going to be a chain rule. So it's going to be minus cosine because the derivative of sine is cosine. And then we're going to take the derivative of pi x. We'll keep the pi x the same. On the outside, we're going to multiply by pi because that's the chain rule. You multiply by the derivative of the inside function. Finally, same thing here. Uh, the derivative is going to be 1 over x squared, but then you multiply by 2x because of the chain rule. When you plug in negative 1, um, sorry, the chain rule, the inside function of this function right here is uh, 2x. So now we're going to plug in negative 1. and the bottom, it looks like we're just going to get negative 2. That's great. Let's do this part right here. Cosine of negative pi, again, is the same thing as cosine of pi. So in this case, it's negative 1, but be careful with negatives. Negatives are always confusing. Uh, it looks like this negative 1 right here is going to cancel out with this negative 1. So you're just going to get plus pi. And finally, we do need to find f prime of negative 1. But remember that f prime of negative 1 is the same thing as uh, g of negative 1 because f prime is equal to g. So when we plug in negative 1 here, you're going to get negative 1 plus 2. Uh, that's 1. 1 to anything is 1. So it looks like we're going to get 2. So this is 2. And this is our answer. Great. So again, uh, this was found because f prime of negative 1 was equal to g of negative 1. So this is just a pretty common look because question. Again, every single limit on the AP exam could be a look because question. And especially it would be in sort of this sort of scenario. You do want to check if it's L'Hopital's rule by setting, uh, finding the limits actually of the top and the bottom. Then you say by L'Hopital's rule, original limit equals new limit of the derivatives. Of course, as you're taking derivatives, you want to be careful of the chain rule. Also, don't confuse uh, L'Hopital's rule with quotient rule. You would not want to take the quotient of this. This would be really bad and it would be wrong and that's not a great combination. Quotient rule is for derivatives, L'Hopital is for limits, but lim it happens to be that you're taking derivatives of the top and the bottom. And then finally, we did plug in negative 1, f prime of negative 1 being g of negative 1, so it wasn't too bad. So now, let's do this final question, a little bit of a tricky question. Let h of x be the function defined by h of x equals f of x minus x. Find the maximum value of h. This says h on the interval. I couldn't even read my own handwriting from negative 1x to 25. So this is the closed interval method. Before we start, um, remember that if you want to watch a video on the closed interval method, we have videos on that. We have videos on L'Hopital's rule, uh, equation of the tangent lines, concavity. So be sure to check out any specific video if you're having trouble with that. But in this case, uh, we're going to do the closed interval method, which is three steps. The first step in this case is pretty easy. All we're going to do is rewrite the function because this is the function we're taking the max of. Sometimes it's not, it doesn't match the given, which is a harder version, but in this case it does. Let's rewrite f of x so that we don't have to keep writing it. It's going to be negative 1x g of t dt minus x. And let's again rewrite it. What's g of t? It's going to be 2 times x plus 2 to the negative 1 third. So it's going to be 2. Sorry, my memory is bad. 2. Uh, I can take the 2 out because it's a constant, so I'm going to take it out. t plus... Uh, I believe 2 to the negative one third. So that's the first step, just finding the function you want to take the max or min of. In this case, it was pretty easy because it was given, but sometimes it's not. The second step is the critical point step, which involves taking the derivative of this function and setting it equal to 0. So this is actually going to require a little bit of algebra, so let's do this slowly. Well, h prime of x, we're just going to take the derivative of this guy right here. Uh, remember that the derivative of f is f prime. In this case, it's g because the integral goes away. So again, what we're doing is we're just plugging in the x here. Sorry, there's still a minus x on the side. So uh, the derivative would be 2 times x plus 2 to the negative 1 third. Then this minus x is outside of the integral, so we have to still take the derivative of this, so it'd be minus 1. We're setting it equal to 0. Because we want to remember that this step is finding the critical points, or really we're finding relative min or max so that they could be the maximum value. So 
it's important to just write equals zero because again, you can get points even if you didn't take the derivative correctly or you're not gonna solve correctly. But we're going to try to solve this out. Again, when you have a negative exponent, sometimes it's good to rewrite it as a, a fraction. So we're gonna get two over x plus three to the one third. We're gonna bring this negative one over, so it's gonna be one. So all I'm doing is trying to find these x's. Usually it's easier than this, but because we have this negative exponent, it's a little bit tricky. I'm gonna bring this over, so it's gonna be two equals x plus three to the one third. I can cube everything to isolate, to get rid of this cube root. So it's gonna be two cubed, which is eight, is equal to uh, x plus three. So finally, uh, why I don't know why I wrote x plus three, this is x plus two, so let me rewrite it. So again, be careful. Um, I've been doing this for a while and I keep making up mistakes. Obviously mistakes aren't the worst thing in the world. Remember mistakes are ways that we improve, um, but you wanna be able to catch them when they're small little ones like rewriting. So in this case, when we set the derivative to be equal to zero and we solved and we rewrote it correctly, we ended up getting that X is equal to six. So now we are ready for the hardest step. The hardest step of course being um, the table. So anytime you have this table, the first thing to do is include the x's. You always include the endpoints, negative one and 25. And then you include any critical points that fit within this interval. Of course, six is in between these two numbers, so we are going to include it. So now what we need to do is we need to plug in these three numbers individually into this function right here. So we do have a little bit of work, but let us it's not gonna be too bad actually. Let's plug in negative one first. When you plug in negative one here, you're plugging it into the top of the integral. So again, uh, this integral will actually be zero because you're going from negative one to negative one. When we plug it in here, it'll be minus negative one. So in this case, we're gonna get plus. We can label this as h of x. Again, we're plugging in these three numbers separately. I'm gonna plug in 25 next because when we plug in 25, we're gonna get f of 25. But we did that in our previous question, that's 24, so I'm gonna use that. So in this case, you're gonna plug in uh, 25 here. F of 25 happens to be 24. So 24 minus 25 is negative one. So all I have to do is actually plug in six. So what I need to do is um, I need to put a six here and I need to take the integral again. I can do that pretty quickly though. So let's do that on the side here. So H of six is equal to two times the integral of negative one to six, uh, T plus two to the negative one third. And then we have to remember to minus, uh, subtract six because there is this minus x in this function where f is just the integral. So it's gonna be minus six at the end because we're plugging in x for six. So I'm not gonna do a, um, a uh, u sub like I did for the first one because again, this function's inside is not very difficult because its derivative is one. So in this case, all I'm gonna do is I'm going to, um, I don't know why I have t's there. Oh, because there's t's there, but it's fine. So I'm just going to take the integral, t plus 2. I'm going to add 1 to this exponent. Again, this is going to be 2 thirds. We're going to multiply by 3 halves, but when we multiply by 3 halves, the 2's will cancel, so it's just going to be 3. And then I'm going to plug in 6 and negative 1. When I plug in 6, it'll be 6 plus 2 to the uh, 2 thirds, which is 8 to the 2 thirds. Remember that when you have 8 to the 2 thirds, you always want to do the fractional part. So that's going to be 2. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. So that when I plug in 6, I'm going to get 12. And then when I plug in negative 1, I get the same thing. Uh, you get 1 to the 2 thirds, which is always 1. So it's just going to be 3. And in this case, the answer is 9. So this is the max value. Abs max value is 9 at um, x is equal to 6. And we are done with this free response question. So let me review what we did for all the questions and then I'll talk about the last one as well. So equation of the tangent line required us to find the point in the slope like normal. The derivative actually was pretty easy by the fundamental theorem of calculus. For the point, uh, all we did was plug in 25 and we did this integral however you want to do the integral. Then we wrote the equation of the line. Throughout this, we did have to practice fractional exponents and negative exponents, but they're not too bad if you uh, do the root always before you do the power. Then we had a concavity question. Because we can take multiple derivatives, we, mul we took derivatives as quickly as possible. 
And then we notice that for any number we plugged in, it's negative, so f is concave down because the second derivative was negative on this interval. We had a nice L'Hopital's question, which we verified that the limit at the top and the bottom was equal to zero, and then we just applied L'Hopital's rule uh, using the fact that we were careful with the chain rule when it appeared, which is why this pi is here and this 2x is here. Then we plugged in negative 1. Uh, to find f prime of negative 1, again, it's g because f prime equals g. Finally, we had a nice max or min question, which is um, at somewhere on the AP exam free response questions. They could appear in the accumulation free response questions, particle motion, uh, the graph free response questions. So if you want to check out those videos um, to practice more absolute max or min questions. But in this case, it was on the miscellaneous. So what we did is we identified the function. Uh, we took the derivative of that function, where the derivative of this integral is still g. We It was not as obvious of what the zeros actually were, so we did a little bit of algebra and found that x is 6. And then we constructed the table on this interval, where we plugged in all three of these points into the function slowly. Um, we had already done 25. Negative 1 is easy because you're going from negative 1 to 1. So the only thing that we actually had to do was 6, so we took that integral on the side here, again using the power rule, and then we were able to finish the question. So hopefully you can see that this free response question, while it was tricky because we had this negative exponent here, and we had a function def uh, defined as an integral, it still wasn't bad. This is definitely not a free response question where if you look at it, you have no idea what to do. Again, even if you don't execute it perfectly, just knowing what to do will lead you through the question. Equation the tangent line, I need point and slope. Well, how do you take uh, a derivative of a integral? Because I need that for the slope. Concavity, how do you go, go, go for two derivatives? L'Hopital's rule, take the, the derivatives of the numerator and the de denominator, max or min. Do the three process, the three-step process. Identify the function. Try to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. Try to construct the table. So this these free response questions, uh, if they're well-designed, they're designed so that even if you don't know how to do everything perfectly, you will be able to get questions. So what I want this video series to be about is for you to build your confidence. Even if you see some harder levels like difficulty six and onwards, hopefully you'll join us for that. You'll get accustomed to being like, I don't know how to do this exactly, but I know sort of the process of what to do. And then you do that. But until then, uh, hopefully we will see you in our difficulty seven through 10 videos. They are, of course, probably our best and most important uh, playlists because it will also review you for the multiple choice and you'll see a wide, wide range of topics. But until then, thanks again for joining me and I'll see you then.